says, give me a sentence with the word delight in it. Once again, my hand was up first. My answer was, the wind blew in the window and blew out the light. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing I knew, the not long ago, a friend of mine asked me what was the greatest pleasure I got from spending my whole life as an actor. There have been so many that I had to think about that for a moment. And I said, like everyone else, I like to be with a happy crowd. And that's the comedian's greatest privilege and pleasure, I think. To have been with so many happy crowds whom he's made laugh with his pratfalls and other clowning antics. He was lying outside ready to do his part. He wondered and wondered what had happened in there, but he did not dare call to high horse. So he left. <laughs> now when it was getting light in the teepee, the girl awoke and the first thing she saw was a terrible animal, all white, with black stripes on it, lying asleep beside her bed. So she screamed. Then the old woman screamed. The old man yelled. High horse jumped up, scared almost to death. He nearly knocked the teepee down getting out of there. People were coming running from all over the village with guns and bows and axes. Everybody was yelling. By now, High Horse was running so fast that he hardly touched the ground at all. And he looked so terrible that the people fled from him and let him run. Some braves wanted to shoot at him, but the others said he might be some sacred being and it would, be, would bring bad trouble to kill him. He was up in front of the girl's teepee. The old man was there and High Horse called out to him and asked if he thought maybe this would be enough horses for the girl. The old man did not wave him away this time. It was not the horses that he wanted. What he wanted was a son who was a real man and good for something. So High Horse got his girl after all, and I think he deserved her. <laughs>
Besides, as every Iditarod musher knows, if you're not the lead dog, the view never changes. <laughs> <laughs> when I cut my own pay, as I had promised to do, they accused me of trying to shoehorn myself into a lower tax bracket. <laughs> Wish I'd have thought of that. <laughs> the enlightened elite, I want to tell you to sit down and shut up. But the way forward is to stand and fight. Throw tea parties. March on Capitol Hill. Write letters to the editor. Run for local office. You never can tell where it might be. And make your voice heard in every election on every issue. It is your birthright. Now stand, stand together, and let's make this country great. education gag sure got me lit. <laughs> but us poor old dumb parents, we just string along and do the best we can and send them as long as we're able because we want them to have the same handicaps the others have. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about taxes. <laughs> Boy, when you talk about taxes, you're going to hear a howl like a pet raccoon. <laughs> this money that the government's thrown away just where is it coming from? Everybody says, where is it coming from? Well, I don't know, but just off his hand, I'd say, it's coming from those that got it. <laughs> They'd always pray. That's one thing a pilgrim would do, is always pray. Usually for more Indian corn. <laughs> and you know, you've never seen a picture of a pilgrim that they didn't have a gun sitting there right next to him in that photograph. Am I right? Right there in that picture. That was to be sure. They got what they were bringing. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to read from Miles to Go by Miley Cyrus. Not all butterflies and flowers. To say that sixth grade was not a good year <laughs> would be the understatement of the decade. <laughs> we'll find each other. Me and the other in-between artsy people realize we better join forces and make the best of it. If you miss all that fun, you risk being an outcast, a loser. <laughs> If you've been through middle school, then you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Welcome to sixth grade social hell. <laughs> I wasn't oblivious to world hunger and things like illiteracy and pandemics. I knew my problems were relatively puny, but they were mine. 
and they felt heavier than the world on my shoulders. So, if you had, want to know if I liked school back then, then the answer is definitely no. <laughs> read to me, her voice weaving its spell of character, plot, and place, until I too yearned to decipher the fine black letters printed on the page. Many small children and a select group of adults, there's a fine line between reality and fantasy, and it's easy to cross back and forth, just as little boys try to trot off to face imaginary bad guys in their Superman caves. Books and their stories help children do just that. I wanted children to dream of possibilities beyond their city blocks, beyond their brick school walls. introduce our next star, who has also dabbled in the political arena. He was born in, wait for it, wait for it, Honolulu, Hawaii. It is a pleasure to address you tonight and talk about literacy and libraries, places where we discover stories, data, and profound concepts. If we've learned how to read, right? Right. The moment we persuade a child, any child, to cross the literary threshold, we've changed their lives forever for the better. If you'll take that risk. Sometimes I wonder whether the world's being run by smart people who are putting us on or by imbeciles who really mean it. <laughs> and I wish to say to him, man to man, simplified spelling is all right, but like chastity, and politics, it can be carried too far. <laughs> I will end now before I set a bad example. It has been experience that few things are harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. <laughs> I am Samuel L. Clemens, Mr. Mark Twain. Thank you.